各位早上好，这个不好意思让各位稍微耽搁了一下。啊，今天这个 session 呢，介绍了买手最新的一个高考量方案，啊，我们叫买手 class set。那我们如果说你有关心过买手，你大概知道我们买手在最近这几年在大力推展一个叫 InnoDB cluster。那 InnoDB cluster 它是在一个 data center 里面做高考用。那你的机器都在同一个 data center， 但是如果说你的问题扩大了整个 data center， 整个 data center 不见的时候，你要怎么去做 disaster recovery？ 怎么去把你的故障移转做到另外一个一个一个 data center 上面，备份 data center 上面？那这个地方呢，我们会会介绍马来西亚的 InnoDB Cloud Set， 这是我们最新的一个方案。那 h e n e r o 是来自于新加坡，所以不好意思，他可能得讲英文啊。那另外就是我们。如果说你有问题的话，呃，可以可以直接用中文问，那我会帮你翻译啊。那或者说，如果说你有什么地方听得不太清楚啊，随时举手，那听你的问题。好，那我们就先欢迎海南头哥的分享，谢谢。Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh joining my presentations. Okay, today, uh, we will be Uh, presenting about this uh, stack recovery solutions on high availability yeah? using MySQL InnoDB cluster set. Uh, with me, I'm Antawi Chaksono, and I'm Master Principal Solution Engineer, and I work with uh, Oracle MySQL. So, with, without further ado, okay, I will continue with the discussions about the. Okay, th this is uh, not running here. Yeah. Sorry for the technical problems. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. InnoDB cluster is a clustering solution based on shared nothing architecture for MySQL database. Any tables that you know stored in the in the database using uh, InnoDB storage engines will be replicated over in very consistent manner. So whatever transactions that coming to the one of the nodes, it will be replicated over to all nodes. And we can guarantee the consistency with uh, recovery point objective equal to zero. That means no data loss at all. So every members in InnoDB clusters, okay, uh, will form a cluster, form a group, okay, to certify the transactions, let's say. Uh, if there is any new transactions uh, that coming to the one of the nodes and that transaction is committed on that nodes, before MySQL commit that transactions to the storage engine, it will replicate over okay, the bin lock event uh, to the rest of the nodes for quorum process or for validations or for certification process uh, to reach the consensus. Once the consensus is reached, that means Uh, the transaction itself being agreed by majority of the node. So each of the InnoDB clusters node members will commit that transactions at their own time on the storage engine, on the InnoDB storage engine. By doing this, actually, we, we can guarantee that you know, each of the nodes okay, will have a very consistent data with no data loss. Uh, the InnoDB cluster mode that we are going to discuss right now is the InnoDB clusters mode that runs on a single primary mode. A single primary mode means that uh, one node will become a primary and the other node become a secondary. Primary means that that nodes will be available for read and write transactions, while the rest of the nodes will be for read replicas, for the secondary node, for the read only uh, uh, queries. Yeah. As you see on the diagram, we have MySQL routers. So the MySQL routers is required Uh, to make sure that the application will always connect uh, to the right nodes. If the applications want to connect to the primary node, routers basically, you know, uh, the application it connect to the uh, read-write port of the MySQL routers. If the application servers want to, I mean, the applications want to connect to the secondary node for query-only operations, then uh, application need to connect to the MySQL routers using read-only port. Normally, read white port is 6446, yeah, the port numbers. That's the default port numbers for the MySQL routers for read write. 
And the default number for the port numbers for uh, read only uh, in the MySQL router is 6447. Uh, if you play with MySQL document store, then the default numbers for MySQL routers to connect to the primary is 64460. And while uh, the read only port is 64470. So the MySQL routers is database endpoint in terms of, of the application. So that the application does not need to know which one is primary, which one is secondary because of the MySQL routers anyway. And uh, you know, MySQL router will act as a database uh, to provide the connection transparency to the application so that application developers does not need to change their applications when they want to connect to the InnoDB cluster. So connecting to the InnoDB clusters is exactly the same like uh, what application need uh, to connect to the standalone instance. And if one of the node fails, for example, like primary node fails, we guarantee the high availability by failover uh, the primary node to one of the secondary nodes. So the one of the secondary node will be promoted as the primary node. And this is a read scale out solutions. As you, you know, as uh, we mentioned before, that one is a primary and the rest are secondary nodes uh, for uh, read operations. Then if you have uh, additional workload that you think that maybe three is not sufficient, maybe you want to add additional nodes and let your uh, read operations connect to the MySQL routers and you know more load balance across the uh, uh, secondary node, then you can add more members over there. And uh, please note that this is based on shared nothing architecture. The cluster works, uh, rely on a network bandwidth and latencies. And then uh, we, uh, we need to make sure that, you know, the uh, CPU uh, core uh, associated to these InnoDB clusters node members need to be sufficient enough. Uh, typically, it's bigger than, you know, what normally you uh, size for standalone instance because you know additional overhead will be required because these clusters require additional resource uh, for uh, running the group applications to replicate the data and so on. If you fail to do that, then you know one of the nodes become busy. Uh, once it is busy, then there will be a replications lack. Okay, uh, the data is coming here but not coming here, whatever, whatsoever. That jeopardizes the cluster's um, stability. But we built the flow controls. Okay, to handle the replication lags. Means that if one of the nodes is completely behind, then the cluster can use flow control basically to throttle the application and your cluster's uh, performance will be dropped because of that. So uh, be careful uh, to size up the InnoDB cluster. You need to size up uh, bigger than uh, what you size up the uh, uh, MySQL in standalone mode. And like uh, we, I said before, uh, if the transaction is coming and then it's committed, and there will be a you know, validation or certification process uh, to make sure that all nodes are agreed uh, with the transactions. So once that all nodes are agreed with the transactions, then each of the nodes will do a commit on its own time. So we call it as eventual consistency over here. But this eventual consistency will give you performance, but this eventual consistency uh, will not guarantee if you at the same at the same time or at the mi microseconds or milliseconds okay, if there is any query comes in to the secondary nodes it does not guarantee that you will get uh, the latest data that committed because the data is not being committed to the storage engine even though uh, the transactions logs is already over there so if you have applications that you think that when you do query you need to um, Make sure that the query will get the latest data and not steal data, st data. Then you can change the configurations for that particular thread, for that particular connections, okay, to change the consistency level on the session level. Okay, uh, not to use eventual, but you can use before, after, before, and after consistency whatsoever. Okay, uh, we call it as uh, full consistency. So no stale reads. So whatever you read, it will be the latest data. Okay, that's the uh, background of the InnoDB clusters. So how about the uh, routers? Uh, many people are asking, okay, how I can deploy MySQL routers inside the InnoDB cluster? Is it on the database servers? No, this is not on the database level, server level. So MySQL routers, best is to install on the application servers and running together with the application service. So the applications will need to connect to the MySQL routers that 
uh, running on the same VM or same bare metal servers. And the uh, connection is local, does not need to use uh, networks. There is no need to use, um, you know, uh, going out for, to the servers and reach the MySQL router. So the network hop is only one, one. Okay, for the MySQL servers to reach the uh, one of the node of the NODP you know, class or something like that. So if we have uh, multiple application servers, each of the application servers will run MySQL routers and so on. And uh, you know, whenever the applications connect to read-only nodes, then it will be load balance, right? Whenever the applications uh, need uh, connect to the MySQL routers that are running on the same uh, servers uh, on read-write port, then you know, it, uh, the connections will be going to the primary node. However, some customers might not, uh, you know, want that. Yeah? Uh, they want to decouple uh, routers uh, from the application servers. Yes, you can. You can actually install MySQL routers in your, ser your own servers, okay, uh, or VM, yeah? However, okay, please understand that MySQL router is stateless uh, applications. It does not uh, persist data and we don't build the high availability for the MySQL routers because this is stateless anyway. So uh, you can have like, you know, virtual IP uh, failover, that kind of thing, okay? You can have uh, multiple MySQL routers running on its own VM or its own servers and the applications need to connect to MySQL routers via VIP, okay? When disaster happens, okay, or failure happens on the design number one, okay, uh, it doesn't matter because the application server is down anyway. So you don't need to have MySQL routers high availability in that sense, right? However, if you have, you know, design number two, okay, the virtual IP failovers will, uh, you know, uh, provide the MySQL routers, you know, uh, service to the applications. In case that is one down, then VIP will switch uh, to the MySQL router number two so that the applications can continue to connect, uh, connect to the InnoDB clusters as uh, per normal. So uh, this is the uh, InnoDB cluster architecture, basically. It is depends on the group applications plugin as the high availability framework. It is based on the Paxos variants uh, and require majority members to be available. Okay, if you shut down two servers, I mean, shut down normals, uh, two servers, this will be still survive, okay? Because uh, clusters knows what happened to this, this, this uh, two servers, you shut down. However, if these two servers suddenly down, suddenly, um, you know, crash, uh, this server does not know, okay, what happened to those two servers, therefore, it lost majority members then uh, this uh, cluster's node will also not function. Uh, uh, before 8.0.27, every member uh, in the InnoDB cluster is the leaders when driving the consensus. Yeah? Consensus, uh, we know that if there is any transaction that committed, before it is really committed to the straight engine, it requires consensus for at least majority members of the nodes agree with the trans transactions before the, that transaction is being you know, committed to the storage engine. But after 8.0.27, because majority of the customers or majority of the users that use uh, InnoDB cluster uh, are using a uh, single primary mode, okay? Then now, as of 8.0.27, uh, you can actually uh, configure, optionally can configure uh, to use a single consensus leader. That means the primary node will be the uh, uh, leader uh, to drive the consensus. And it will improve the performance and resiliency. Okay, this slide basically talk about the, uh, you know, high availability orchestrations. Uh, like we mentioned before, is uh, if the primary node fails, then it will be fail over to one of the secondary nodes and uh, become the primary, right? And once the primary node comes back, I mean the, the fail node comes back, it will automatically rejoin back to the cluster. If it is unable to join the clusters, okay, we have uh, configurable parameters to make sure that there will be auto rejoin tries, right? Uh, you can configure up to 2016 time, and uh, each time will be, you know, every five minutes. Okay, incidents can happen many times, but, you know, incidents can become a disaster if you are not prepared, okay? So, 
Preparation is very important. That's why uh, business and IT need to be aligned uh, in terms of providing the, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, IT to provide the, uh, you know, uh, system that can, you know, meet the surface level agreement as required by the business. So normally, uh, if we talk about high availability and disaster recovery, we talk about the concept of RTO and RPO. RTO is basically uh, the time required basically for the systems to come back before the business can, you know, lose money, yeah? And the RPO, or recovery point objective, is uh, how, mu how much data loss that can be, um, you know, accepted by the business. So the RTO RPO is required, okay, in order for the IT to actually uh, design the disaster recovery and high availability solutions. Okay, in terms of, you know, DB clusters, since we are talking about clusters, okay, let's say we, we have uh, three not in DB clusters, okay, we have options, uh, we have various options. For example, uh, we can create uh, clusters, you know, DB clusters, where each of the cluster members running on uh, its own data center. Let's say we have three data centers and three NoDB clusters. Uh, we can have like, you know, uh, each of the members running on its own data center. However, as we know that every transactions commit, every write, it will drive the consensus. Consensus means that they need to have, you know, good network communication in order for maintaining cluster performance and cluster stability. In theory, we can do that, but in, pra in practicals, it is very hard to achieve because uh, you might need to have high bandwidth, low latency in order to run, you know, uh, st stretch out cluster, something like this. MySQL routers uh, can run everywhere. Okay, you can have a primary uh, nodes in Taipei, uh, at Taipei Data Center, and you can have, you know, applications running at uh, Kaohsiung Data Center connected to MySQL routers. And because of MySQL routers, and then, uh, MySQL routers will redirect the connections to that uh, primary database that's running at uh, Taipei data center and so on. And uh, this design have implications as implication. If the uh, InnoDB clusters node that running at Taipei data center suddenly crash, then it will trigger site failover or something like that because there is no high availability on each own uh, you know, data center. Better design is actually we have uh, six node in ODB clusters, okay, across uh, three uh, data centers. So each data centers will run uh, two node in ODB clusters, something like this. Okay, so whenever disaster happen at you know uh, one of the cluster nodes fails, in uh, for example primary uh, nodes of the in ODB cluster fails at Taipei data center, then it will trigger automatic failover to another node that's running at Taipei data center. So it won't, uh, it won't, uh, you know, uh, do a site failover to another, another uh, nodes in the other data center, either Taichung or Kaohsiung. However, if there is any site failures, okay, uh, Taipei data center fail, for example, then yes, it will trigger uh, automatic failovers. One of the nodes uh, in Taichung or Kaohsiung will be promoted as a new uh, primary node. Okay, how about if you only have uh, two data centers and you have uh, three nodes in ODB clusters? So you end up running uh, two nodes uh, in ODB clusters, for example, in this diagram at Taipei data center, and one node as it's just disaster recovery running on calcium in this diagram, right? However, uh, again, like I said, uh, this di design require, you know, high bandwidth and low latencies in order to maintain the MySQL cluster performance, especially for right operations. However, if there is any site failure, at Taipei data center, okay, this node will lose majority members. So this node will not be available as well. Okay, so the DBA need to go into the, uh, um, connect into the, uh, uh, this 
uh, clusters not member, and then uh, need to execute force quorum using partition off in order to promote this one as the primary. Remember the, in this scenario, the InnoDB clusters lost the uh, majority of nodes. Therefore, the remaining nodes will not be survived. And uh, we need to uh, manually uh, promote the uh, one of the nodes, okay, uh, to become a new primary. As of 8.0.27, uh, we have additional options with regards to disaster recovery uh, of InnoDB clusters. So you can set up uh, more than one InnoDB clusters. For example, in this diagram is two InnoDB clusters, okay, and one clusters become a primary cluster and the rest of the clusters become replica clusters. And between primary cluster and replica clusters, there will be asynchronous replications. Since asynchronous replication does not need to have consensus, then you can, have, can relax the uh, you know, uh, requirements for high bandwidth and low latencies because this is just asynchronous replications. So the consensus will be driven you know, only within the cluster. Okay? Once the consensus is reached, every, uh, the, the transactions will be committed to the storage engine. It will create a bin lock event, and bin lock event will be sent over uh, to the primary node of the replica cluster. And there will be another consensus over here until all of the nodes okay, will have the same set of data. All right? And as you know, that primary usually running on read-write and the rest of the node running on uh, read-only. But in InnoDB cluster set framework, in InnoDB cluster set architecture, the primary node of the primary cluster is the only one, is the only node that running on read-write. The rest are it only, including the primary node that are running on the replica clusters. So, with InnoDB cluster set, okay, within the InnoDB cluster, okay, a recovery point objective is zero. There is no data loss. And RTO is second to minutes. Okay, whenever the primary node fail, it will be failover to one of the secondary nodes within the cluster itself. It requires seconds to minutes. It's good read performance because consensus will only happen uh, within the cluster itself, within the same data center itself. All right. Uh, how about across InnoDB clusters? There will be primary to primary asynchronous replications, okay, between the primary node of the primary cluster and primary node of the replica clusters. And it is still good write performance because no synchronization to other data centers is required because consensus does not uh, happen in asynchronous replication. It just send the data. Uh, but recovery point objective uh, is not zero, right? In any solution that requires asynchronous replication because this is asynchronous, we cannot guarantee that the data that already committed on the master or on the primary will be available on the replica and so on. So in this case, okay, uh, in this diagram, we have three node InnoDB clusters running on at Taipei data center as a primary cluster, as well as uh, three node InnoDB cluster uh, at uh, Kaohsiung data center as a replica cluster. And if you want to switch roles between these two, it's easy. Okay, in InnoDB cluster set, we, we have the admin API as well. Right? Not just InnoDB cluster, but InnoDB cluster set, we already built the admin API. So you can set primary cluster just to, to flip the uh, replica cluster to become a primary cluster, and primary cluster become a replica cluster, and so on. How about the applications? Since the application connected to router, routers, later on I will uh, explain that the routers uh, will redirect the connections to primary cluster mainly, so that your application does not need to change. Your router does not need to change. Okay, whenever you flip, okay, the connection is also flipped. Okay, if the primary node of the primary cluster fail, then uh, the new uh, primary will be running on one of the secondary nodes. And that secondary nodes become a primary uh, nodes uh, with read write. And automatically, again, automatically, the replication channels will be changed Okay, it's no longer from here, but it is moving also. Okay, the replication channel moves to the new primary node, and it will connect to the uh, primary nodes of the replica cluster, something like that. 
So it is automatic. <laughs> so if we have the uh, primary nodes of replica cluster, uh, situations whereby primary node of the replica cluster is down, then yeah, it will trigger automatic failovers. The primary node will move to here, okay, and uh, new this secondary node will become a primary node, but still you know operating in read only, and it will automatically start the replication channels, okay, to you know uh, to synchronize the data uh, between primary node of the primary cluster to primary node to the replica cluster. So this mechanism is also automatic uh, in, uh, in ODB cluster set. So this is the limitations of in ODB cluster set. Okay, uh, anything regarding cross-site failovers, it will be like, you know, normal uh, source uh, replica, normal MySQL asynchronous replication. Therefore, there is no guarantee, no data loss during cross-site failover. No built-in cross uh, split uh, cross-site split brain preventions. So, because this is just uh, asynchronous replications, so if the suddenly uh, Taipei data center is down, then uh, this replica cluster does not have cap uh, automations to convert itself uh, to become a primary cluster. Therefore, the DBA uh, need to go in over here, connect over here, and promote this uh, cluster to become a primary cluster. So multi-primary mode is not supported. Okay, we are just talking about single primary mode. And uh, this is very important. If you have requirement that no data loss is required, then uh, do not use uh, InnoDB cluster set. Okay, you need to deploy MySQL InnoDB cluster across data center, okay, to maintain the uh, uh, RPO equal to zero. Okay, in the event of uh, primary data center downs, okay, it will not automatically trigger said site failovers. Okay, we need to do emergency failovers. Okay, to manual by manually promote the replica clusters to become a primary clusters using my clusters dot sorry my cluster set dot first primary cluster blah blah blah. So yeah, to promote uh, InnoDB cluster running on Kaohsiung, at Kaohsiung Data Center uh, to become a new primary cluster and so on. Okay, the InnoDB clusters, uh, sorry, cluster set can also run on uh, three data center. For example, in this diagram, you have uh, three InnoDB clusters, okay, uh, within a single cluster set. You have a primary cluster running on Taiwan and uh, replica cluster running on Japan and, uh, and, and Tokyo. You can do that because this is just asynchronous replication. So, so it, it works that way. However, okay, we also, um, you know, have like, for example, you want to, uh, you know, uh, not running three node in ODB cluster. Let's say you want to relax the requirements. I want to, uh, you know, to have uh, my servers, my DR servers on Korea, not running on three node, but running on one node. Yes, you can do that. So, yeah. So, it, uh, we don't have requirements uh, for every node to be on the same topology. Okay, every cluster to be on the same topology. So, we can have like, you know, this is three node, this is maybe five node, this is one node, or vice versa, whatsoever, right? So, even though this is uh, one node, the most important thing that we need to know is is even though this is one node, actually it is in ODB clusters, but only single node, which is only primary node, yeah? And this is how to configure in ODB cluster set, very easy. Uh, later on, if we have time, I think we have time, uh, we can do uh, some demo, okay, how to create in ODB cluster set. Okay, basically it's just uh, create in ODB clusters, and then after that, define that as InnoDB cluster set. And immediately, that clusters become primary clusters of the InnoDB cluster set. And then uh, we can, you know, create replica clusters. We can uh, provision another nodes and create that nodes as a replica cluster. And that node become a primary nodes of the replica clusters. And just add nodes uh, to that uh, replica clusters. 
and we can have uh, three node InnoDB clusters on uh, primary cl at primary clusters as well as three node at replica clusters. And we can set primary instance. We can we can switch uh, primary instance within the clusters. Okay, let's say we want to run uh, primary node of the primary cluster on secondary so on second nodes. Yes, we can use this one, or we can switch roles between a replica cluster and primary clusters. And in the event of failures, okay, uh, we can force a primary cluster uh, to promote replica cluster forcefully to become a primary cluster. Okay, this is how to set up MySQL routers. Uh, it's exactly the same like uh, the InnoDB clusters anyway. And uh, we can do, uh, you know, uh, routing options to see, okay, the default configuration as well as uh, configuration that apply on each of the routers. Okay, this is the integrations of MySQL routers to InnoDB cluster set. So we have a primary clusters over here on the left and replica cluster on the right. So routers, okay, read write traffics will always go to the primary node of the primary cluster, no matter where the router is running within the within the wide area networks. Uh, let's say routers running on the secondary data centers, uh, read write traffic is always going to the read write node, uh, primary node of the primary cluster, and so on. While read only will always going to the primary cluster, so the default is always primary cluster. However, uh, sometimes uh, we want to have you know, this uh, system that actually reading uh, okay, from the uh, replica cluster. Yes, we can create uh, one router and we can change the target routing for that router to only to this one, right? So if this one become a replica cluster, then uh, this router number two on the, on the right hand side, it will only receive uh, read only traffic. Any read write traffic, any DML will be dropped. So, um, yeah, this, this one how to set. Uh, basically, if target cluster is specific, then yeah, uh, it won't go to the primary. It will go to this particular specific InnoDB cluster within the InnoDB cluster set. If the target cluster is primary, it will always follow the primary cluster. If primary cl cluster switch, then the connection will also be switched. So, if this one, uh, these two commands basically to change the configuration on particular routers and this one is to change uh, configurations on the globally on, 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 on every routers yeah yeah this is uh, how if how uh, what happens if we switch cluster roles I'm sorry the line is not uh, really clear uh, in this uh, uh, screens. Okay, let's say we have situations whereby uh, one of the cluster become invalidated. I mean, it cannot join back to the clusters completely because maybe you know additional transactions happening over here, and when we want to join this cluster back to the cluster set, uh, just having an issue. So <clears throat> actually the routers itself, we can configure uh, to handle such situations. Okay, whether we want to accept read only or we want routers to completely uh, do not connect to the invalidated cluster. So if we want to accept read only, just this, this one is the command. So any traffics, uh, read-only traffics uh, from the application to the router number two on the right, it will go to the uh, clusters on the right, even though that cluster is not no longer part of the uh, cluster set, is, is, is invalidated cluster within the cluster set itself. But if we change the configuration to drop all, then yeah, even the read-only traffics will be blocked uh, on the router number two. So there are no a uh, read-write uh, 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 as well as a read-only going to the invalidated uh, clusters. Still have time? Yeah. I think uh, 
is almost done. Uh, on the next five minutes, maybe I, I can I can show about the uh, how to create the InnoDB cluster set easily. I uh, just creating the InnoDB cluster set. That's all. Uh, we don't have time to to do a fail over all those things, right? So. Okay, uh, I already set up the one VM. Okay, for me to show to you how to configure the InnoDB cluster set. Mm -hmm. As we know, that InnoDB cluster set is like um, you know, it must be running on different kind of uh, VM or bare metal server. Since I only play with the one VM, then in order to differentiate uh, between one instance to another instance, I use port. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, I already saved my commands, okay, in uh, my GitHub. Okay, first of all, I, I want to uh, create the, uh, the first node. I want to provision the first database. Something like this. Deploy the first instance using Sandbox. OK, I have one instance running already, standalone. So now I configure the second instance. OK, since this is one VM, then the second instance I set the port number as uh, 3312. So the first one is 3311, the second one is 3312. OK, done. So now I set up 3313 as the third node. Uh, yeah, for my first cluster. Okay, I already have uh, three nodes, yeah, but they are standalone. Okay, so now I want to configure that as the InnoDB clusters. I run configure instance on the first node, which is port 3311. Okay, done. So now I run the same command, but this is against uh, 3312, the second node. This step basically will prepare my instance to be uh, in ODB cluster member. This is required. So done. Then I prepare the third node to be one of the in ODB clusters nodes by running the configure instance as well. Once done, then I want to create the InnoDB clusters using the first node as the primary cluster. Sorry, primary member. Done. I already have one cluster, but only have one node, which is the primary. Show you? Okay, one single InnoDB clusters with one node as a primary. Now I want to add the second node to the cluster and the third node to the cluster.
Yeah. And I use recovery method equal to incremental because I know that the second note and the first note are, um, you know, the, the data is the same. Otherwise, if the data is different, I need to change the recovery method to clones. Okay, as, uh, I will show to you. Okay, cluster status. Right now, I have uh, two nodes in ODB clusters. One is primary and second, second one is a secondary node. So now, I add the third node to the cluster. Done. So now I have uh, three nodes in ODB clusters. All right. So what I do now, okay, to create cluster set, just define the cluster set against the primary cluster, which is uh, the cluster that I just showed to you. Done. I already have the cluster set, and this cluster set has only one cluster, which is the primary clusters. So we can check the uh, status of the cluster set using this command. Yeah, I only have one cluster set with one primary clusters, uh, which is my cluster, it's the name. The role is primary. So now I want to create a replica cluster. First of all, I need to create the database first for the replica cluster. Okay, and this database, uh, I'm using port 5311, just to differentiate between the, the first cluster. Okay, start with three, now start with five. So once the database is running, then again, I need to run the configure instance. Okay, now since configure instance already done, then I can easily add that into um, clusters. So I can use clone for this, okay, assuming that the state of the uh, that nodes is different compared to the to the nodes that's available in the InnoDB cluster. So uh, using clone, then uh, the InnoDB um, you know storage engine will will, will, will be create uh, sorry the, the the platform will create the the cluster will create a snapshot and then send over the, the contents uh, physically to the, uh, to the clone target, which is 5311. And once done, we already have uh, two uh, clusters within a single cluster set. As you see over here, now we have uh, two clusters uh, on the single InnoDB cluster set. One is as a primary, the other one is replica. So, uh, based on this, we can add the second node to the third node uh, to the cluster number two, right? So that we have three node in ODB clusters as a primary and three node in ODB clusters as a replica. So yeah, because time constraints, I cannot continue. And on top of that, we can create MySQL routers. We can bootstrap the MySQL routers the same way uh, we bootstrap MySQL routers for the in ODB clusters. Okay, thank you so much.
然后我这个看起来它是加一个，它是 clone 过去，它 clone 过去的时候的的时候，要我们知道满满 SQL 要要 clone 的，你可以等一下先 s e n 下过去，然后要然后要记那个要记那个 vlog 的位置的位置，然后要超过去，然后这边它才能起来，才能建立的就可以建起来。它那它这位它自动做这件事情是做到的。我忘了把。When you clone, when clone, when clone the second instance, uh, the primary instance still writing. Uh, because you know, uh, if we want to, if master class, uh, inner tree class to join the new node, if we uh, find the find the latest uh, uh, GKD of the of the of the node, and uh, to steal the data from the primary server. So how can the decision can be done by, by automatically, or we have, to, we have any uh, need to handle. And uh, if it's automatic, how, how does my energy capture do that? Thank you. OK, uh, the clone plugin is created uh, as part of 8.0.17. Previously, what we need to do is to do backup on the, on, the tar on the source and restore the target and then so on and make sure that the backup is consistent. So the clone plugin, what the clone plugin does is basically uh, it will create a snapshot against InnoDB storage engine. Snapshot. So snapshots must be consistent. OK, and send over the snapshot over to the target nodes. OK, uh, whenever snapshot already created and sent over, okay, it's physically sent over and then restores to the target nodes. Like what you said, you are very right that uh, during that period, there will be new transactions comes in. Okay. But we, we keep the GTIDs, right? We keep the GTID and the backup is, I mean, the, uh, the snapshot is consistent. Once it's done, then we know uh, which GTIDs is actually being applied over there and then we just uh, create asynchronous replications to you know, catch up uh, with the delta transactions of the red here. Sure. <laughs> no power? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> There's no light in it. <laughs> okay. Um, our routers is basically works in layer four in OC layers, which is on a TCP level. Uh, so they are not, uh, it is not uh, able to recognize whether the package is actually read only or read write. So, since we are we are working on the, uh, our routers is working on the layer four, then what happens is, in order to split between read only and read write, it needs to be defined by the applications. If your application is actually doing dashboarding, reporting, and so on, and you want to connect that to the secondary node, so that secondary node will have a job to do. <laughs> then your application need to connect to read-only port of the MySQL routers. 
but it is the OLTP, short transaction, short query. Okay, you maybe uh, wants to connect to the read write part of the MySQL routers. <laughs> okay, so uh, in uh, shared nothing architecture, when uh, the main component is networks. Okay, there is no way for you know each of the cluster members knows about the rest of the, the status of the rest of the nodes uh, without networks. So everything will goes to networks, right? Uh, split brain happens in the situations whereby the the uh, let's say you know DB clusters for nodes. Let's say uh, split brain may happen. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, in this scenario, okay, if the node one able to connect to node two, node three able to connect to node four, but node two cannot uh, connect to net, node three. Okay, that means this is two, two nodes over here and two nodes on, on the left and two nodes on the right, right? You may think that this is split brain. In InnoDB clusters, we prevent this. We prevent this uh, situation to be happen. So we have uh, split brain preventions anyway. So in distributed uh, architecture, uh, shared nothing architecture, okay, split brain may happen. But in InnoDB cluster, it won't happen. It won't happen. Why? Because we have like uh, uh, rules that if the cluster lost majority of members, then the cluster will not work. Any nodes that are still available, still running, it won't work. OK, let's say uh, we have four nodes, something like this. And uh, there is a, a scenario network partitions between a node 2 and a node 3, for example. Then. Uh, each of partition, I mean, each of, not one and not two, uh, two not on the left and two not on the right, both are losing majority members because two is not majority members of four. It is equal, right? So one, two, three, four will not working. So there is no split brain over here. This, this is how we prevent a uh, split brain to happen. So,
这种主主义不符的，就会出现网页。哎，因为你网络断了，两边都可以写，两边各写一半，都起来，两边都要收。Yeah. So in that, without that, uh, what happens is we have a four node, let's say, without split brain preventions, uh, four nodes, yeah? uh, primary node in node one, let's say, and there is a network partitions uh, in the middles, let's say, then node three or node four become primaries, and you have uh, new clusters, right? Two clusters. That's split brains, but this is not. Uh, whenever says, you know network partition happens, we prevent that to be happen. Uh, split brain to happens, we prevent that uh, by majority members. Uh, rules. If uh, any clusters partitions that losing majority members, then it will it will fall to the uh, like what Ivan said is uh, read only, become read only. But of course we can configure the uh, the behavior right. The behavior we can configure for the cluster that lost the majority members either abort or read only and so on. Yeah. So it won't happen. Split brain won't happen. Uh, how, how can we deal with the, the, the 
That's why we make the uh, promotions of the replica cluster become primary cluster manual, manual way. It's not automatic. If this is automatic, then yes, you're right. It may split brain, right? But we are not, we are not putting any automatic uh, mechanisms for a replica cluster to become a primary clusters. It is manual, manual way. Like I, yes. So, in these samples, the uh, in InnoDB clusters at Taipei data center suddenly gone, right? But the, the situation can be worse than that, okay? It is up, but the networks is down. So that's why we don't make this automatically to become a primary clusters, okay? It is manual decisions, okay? Otherwise, it will split brain. You're right. So, could you say to the next part uh, if you have downloaded it? I don't know. So, that might be the issue. Thank you. Okay, this is a MySQL operator for Kubernetes. Okay, uh, we know it's about the NodeDB cluster, and uh, we deploy NodeDB cluster on VM and bare metals. How about if we want to deploy the NodeDB cluster on Kubernetes? The answer is if you want to automate the process of deploying and managing the life cycles of the NodeDB clusters running on Kubernetes, we have MySQL operators that are currently uh, running. Uh, we released the GA versions, uh, I think, a couple of months back. So I want to show to you how easy to deploy InnoDB clusters on Kubernetes, how easy to maintain the InnoDB cluster on Kubernetes. I show you on a previous sessions, okay, about uh, deploying InnoDB cluster on VM. Now I want to show to you how to deploy InnoDB clusters on Kubernetes using MySQL operator. So we skip this one. We already uh, talked about this just now. We also skip this one, okay. And this is just to give a context to this presentation. So allow me to actually uh, talk about Kubernetes a little bit. Yeah. Uh, basically, the Kubernetes is like kind of like a, you know container orchestration platforms. It is open source. And uh, when we talk about container, we talk about the applications, running applications on the 
and also in a, in, in a container, right? And these containers will run uh, inside the uh, Kubernetes worker nodes. Uh, you can imagine Kubernetes worker node is like, like a VM host, but it's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, different concept, okay? But, you know, uh, we, can, we can see that they are actually doing the same thing, right? And uh, this uh, worker nodes is basically controls by, you know, Kubernetes have a control plane. And the control plane consists of API servers, schedules, control manager, and etcd. And it can run on bare metal or VM anyway. Okay, so, and this is the differences between uh, Kubernetes and uh, virtual machines. If we talk about uh, virtual machine, we talk about uh, VM host, and Kubernetes, we call it as uh, uh, Kubernetes worker nodes. And, uh, and, and Kubernetes worker nodes runs uh, pods, inside the pods we have uh, containers, container is lightweight applications uh, that are running on top of the, uh, you know, binary and library that required to run the application. So, so it's, the focus is more towards the applications. Meanwhile, uh, virtual machine, the focus uh, is more towards how to virtualize the servers to run on the virtual environment, how to divide the CPU, RAMs, and I.O. as well as networks resource, okay, to various, uh, you know, so-called mini uh, servers that are running virtually on top of the uh, VM host. So, yeah. So, therefore, the uh, containers are usually lightweight, okay? Then, uh, yeah, far lightweight than uh, VM, and uh, it enables the, the containers to uh, provision uh, very fast, and then if the container's down, and it will easily and then uh, quickly uh, return to the initial states. And we can scale the container very fast and easy. So Kubernetes worker node, uh, like we mentioned before, it can run on top of uh, physical servers or run, can run on top of uh, VM. So when we talk about how to run uh, containers in a, in a Kubernetes, then you know, uh, we have pods over here. So pods is basically uh, to give the network and hostname identity to the, to the container that's running inside. And then the container itself, I mean the pod itself, um, will usually will consist of uh, one container or more. Okay, one pod can run one container or more. Yeah, and uh, if the containers, all the containers within a pod is not running, then pod will mark as not running as well. Therefore, uh, sometimes, especially in the MySQL operators or any operator, sometimes uh, they are using sidecar containers. Sidecar container is a container that helps the uh, the pods to be appear up and running even though the main container is down yeah so that we can we can do uh, some sort of uh, more automations so uh, in terms of deployments okay the MySQL routers as you know they it is stateless applications and in kubernetes if we want to deploy a stateless application, we can have like, you know, we can deploy that as a deployment, we can deploy that as a replica set, or we can deploy that as a de uh, as daemon set, yeah? So in a stateless environment, I mean, sorry, this is, this the line is not uh, very clear over here. Uh, however, if, we, if if the one of the pod crashes within the deployment or replica set, then uh, the nodes, uh, the, the replica set or deployment will be scaled up. It will scale. And this is drop, okay, scale and drop. Yeah. If we talk about MySQL, as we know that MySQL is the uh, try, uh, I mean, is the database. The database that needs to persist data to the persistent storage. Therefore, the state of MySQL is always stateful. Okay, in Kubernetes, uh, to deploy the stateful application, is to, the best is to use a stateful set. So in a stateful set, we can mount the storage. Of course, the deployment also. Uh, we, we, we can mount the storage, but you know, the way um, to mount the storage in a deployment and the way uh, to mount the storage in the stateful set, this one is completely a lot, of, a lot simpler. Therefore, um, since this stateful set is designed to, to have like, you know, to persist the, the, the data, right? So whenever the one of the pods uh, in within the stateful set is crashed, Different with the uh, deployment or replica set, it won't scale, but it will try to, you know, starting up uh, the same uh, pot, the same identity, so that uh, you know, 
it won't scale like uh, what it happens in, in, in deployment or replica set anyway. So pod will consist of one or more containers and MySQL will run inside the pod as one of the containers. Okay, since MySQL need to have persistent storage to persist data, then the storage itself need to be present in Kubernetes as persistent volume. So this persistent volume is the uh, resource that, you know, will makes the, the pod will able to see the storage. And then the pod itself or the container itself can mount the PV a true persistent volume claim. It's like a request, a request uh, how many numbers of, uh, you know, what is the size of the uh, part of the PV that can be, you know, that uh, the, the uh, container needs. And if we take a look on the, on the inside the container itself, especially MySQL container, okay, it will consist of MySQL instance, of course. And this MySQL C instance is the MySQL servers. Okay? And it needs to persist data to the this. Usually, uh, MySQL instance will use data dir, right? Data dir. And then this data dir need to have, you know, uh, need to, we need to provision that this data dir uh, using the uh, persistent volume claim. So again, persistent volume claim will relate to the PV with the storage. Therefore, MySQL will be able to persist data uh, to the storage in this way. And uh, Kubernetes itself does not, uh, you know, by default, um, does not uh, give any uh, fixed IP uh, to to the pods. Usually, they are uh, dynamic dynamic IP, right? So in order to provide the consistent access then uh, Kubernetes uh, provides service. So there are a couple of uh, services that are uh, you know, available in Kubernetes, for example, like cluster IPs, and node port, and load balancers, and external names over here. So um, in, in, in MySQL operators, it will create a couple of resources uh, for InnoDB cluster itself, InnoDB cluster database. Uh, there will be you know, one cluster IP, OK? And InnoDB cluster database will be deployed as stateful set, and there will be a cluster IP for the, uh, the router to connect. And the router itself uh, will have a cluster IP as well. Okay, when it deploys routers as deployment, there will be a cluster IP as well for the application to connect the routers. And additional service uh, we also provide in the InnoDB cluster running on stateful set is for routers to connect to individual database inside the stateful set. So as a good practice, uh, normally, okay, uh, we use compart. I mean, sorry, namespace. The namespace is basically like like compartment. Yeah, it is uh, you know used to group uh, various resources inside the Kubernetes so that it can be more manageable. So usually, I use MySQL desk, uh, clusters as my namespace for you know uh, for deploying you know, the clusters uh, instead of default namespace. And MySQL operator itself uh, will run on the Kubernetes clusters in the MySQL. Uh, Operator namespace. So there will be a new namespace. If you deploy, you know, the, uh, sorry, MySQL operator, then a MySQL operator deployment will create a new namespace called MySQL dash operators inside your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So this is the container image. So we provide community servers, container image, as well as enterprise servers. Okay, the community servers can be downloaded, uh, available on hub.docker.com slash use slash MySQL, while commercial editions. Okay, the MySQL enterprise editions, uh, routers, uh, as well as the operator, and uh, MySQL database available on containerregistry.oracle.com, or you can download from edelivery.oracle.com or support.oracle.com. So now, this is a typical deployment that I see uh, in, a, in a many customers that are using microservices uh, currently. Yeah? Uh, they slice up the applications, okay, and then and, and run the in the Kubernetes as microservice, okay, and then they provide a ser various service, okay, uh, that you know uh, to access the uh, uh, the microservice that running behind, and uh, we need to have English controllers for external traffic to go in uh, to the Kubernetes to access the application service, right, and uh, uh, to provide the high availability. Okay, uh, we can deploy InnoDB cluster. In this example, the InnoDB cluster is deployed on VM or bare metal as monolithic database. Okay, and then uh, in order for this resource that's running on, on Kubernetes be able to 
connect to the InnoDB, InnoDB cluster running outside the Kubernetes, we need to have endpoints. Yeah. The endpoint is basically is Kubernetes resource so that the internal resource can connect to external service. Then uh, we need to have MySQL routers that are running on Kubernetes, usually. Yeah. And these MySQL routers will you know, connect to the endpoints. Yeah. And uh, the uh, microservice will connect to the service in order to connect to the MySQL routers and so on. It's very simple. But what happens if the primary nodes crash? If the uh, pod crash is fine, pod crash is fine because it is uh, easily can, you know, starting up again, easily. But how about if there is any crash in the InnoDB clusters, monolithic InnoDB clusters, and there will be automatic failovers, yes. However, automatic failovers will, you know, uh, during the automatic failovers, the read-write nodes will not be available. The read-write node will not be available. Therefore, the whole entire microservices are running on the Kubernetes will not be able to reach the primary node. So the whole entire system will get affected, even though you already slice up something like this. But if there is any crash in the primary node and there will be a failover, then uh, all these services will get affected. So until the uh, new primary node, uh, you know, available, okay, uh, once the uh, uh, primary failover is n, okay, is completed, then you know the service, the microservice will be able to uh, do, uh, you know, DMLs or do connections to the primary node through the MySQL router over here, and read-write traffic is resumed when the failover is complete. If you want to have like more robust situations, then uh, if we can do, yeah, on the existing database, or maybe you have a new project and you want to run the uh, more agile and robust uh, database design, I mean, system environments, then maybe you can have like, you know, uh, design something like this. Okay, you have microservices running on Kubernetes, you have routers that are running on Kubernetes, as well as you slice up your monolithic database into small one and run it in high availability mode using an ODB cluster. So what happens is, basically, if there is any issue, um, the one not fail, then it will trigger the automatic failover or ever. Okay, the all pods, the application microservices will still be available except the microservices that related to that clusters, related to that cluster. So, so it's, it's your application will still be available, only certain functions will not be available during primary node failover. Since the traffic is divided into multiple InnoDB clusters, then failover will take faster, a lot faster than you have monolithic database and you do failovers. So this is the uh, high levels design, okay, high level architecture. Basically we have MySQL pod, usually three MySQL pod. Each of MySQL pod have the PVC and PV, okay, to store the data, uh, to persist the data, to persistent storage. And we have MySQL routers running on deployment and a replica set or replica set. It is connected to the InnoDB clusters, okay, using the services and so on. And remember, uh, since a uh, high availability uh, objective, yeah, high availability design objective is to eliminate any single point of failure, then on the design level itself, okay, uh, from the infrastructure level, from the Kubernetes level, at least we need to have uh, three nodes, three physical servers, three worker nodes, okay? Because uh, if we only have one or we only have two, we end up in situations there is single point of failure. If that one down, then suddenly you NodeDB know, cluster lost majority member, then you know the cluster will not be functions. Okay, so that if you have a three node NodeDB cluster uh, and you want to run on the Kubernetes, at least you have uh, three physical servers, three v uh, Kubernetes worker nodes. Okay, and run the InnoDB clusters. Okay, uh, across these three uh, physical servers. And come back to the previous design. If we have a lot of InnoDB clusters. Okay, in a in a Kubernetes, then we cannot operationally, yeah, uh, practically, we cannot easily manage that because too many NodeDB clusters. So we come up with the MySQL operators basically to help us to automate the entire lifecycle process uh, for the NodeDB cluster that's running on a Kubernetes. Okay, so the MySQL operators, the value is basically to able to operationalize, yeah, the management life cycles 
of the NDB clusters running on Kubernetes. The question is, are we, without MySQL operators, able to provision an NDB cluster? The answer is yes. However, it will be very difficult if we have, like, for example, uh, 20 microservices and each microservices have its own NDB cluster, then you end up uh, setting up 20 NDB clusters. So this is the MySQL operators. Okay, uh, we are on a phase three. We, have, we can provide the full life cycles of the uh, uh, InnoDB clusters on Kubernetes, basically. Okay, this is the uh, uh, MySQL operators, sorry, the operator maturity levels. So we are on uh, phase three. But however, phase four and phase five, okay, let, for, let's say for example, auto scaling and so on. This is database, this is not a stateless application. This is database, stateful application. Okay, to scale out the InnoDB clusters, okay, to add more node, three node, become five node, it takes manual decisions. Okay, it's not just easy like web servers, Nginx, whatsoever, that can, you can just uh, scale up uh, because, uh, you know, most of them are stateless. Okay, but database is quite different. Okay, of course the same, okay, if we run InnoDB clusters, exactly the same thing like uh, we run on VM and bare metals, okay. Uh, will guarantee no data loss, uh, read scale up, uh, automatic failovers, easy operation, backup recovery, and so on. And this is the, op the MySQL operators for Kubernetes architecture. Basically, we have uh, three node InnoDB clusters. We have MySQL operator running on MySQL operators namespace, okay, that helps to deploy InnoDB clusters. Uh, we can schedule the job with MySQL operators to back up the InnoDB uh, clusters, uh, either on OCI object storage or local uh, backup using MySQL uh, dumb instance, MySQL shell dumb instance. Okay, another architecture diagrams, yeah? So inside the pod, okay, it has sidecar containers. Remember sidecar containers is containers that keeps uh, the pod running, even though the main container, which is MySQL, is down. So the sidecar container will help to deploy InnoDB clusters to configure this, to run configure instance, uh, add instance, create cluster, whatsoever, using these SATCA containers. Okay, I will show to you how easy to deploy in a DB cluster. Like, like you see, okay, uh, sorry, this one is MySQL operator installation. So this is how we install MySQL operators. We can use, uh, you know, Helm chart to install the operators. Yeah, this is how we install the MySQL operators uh, using Helm chart anyway. So we'll see uh, whether MySQL ins uh, operator get installed. Okay, now MySQL operator is running on a Kubernetes. Okay, I need to show to you the option one. Just now it's option two using Helm. Now using, uh, you know, uh, manifest files. So uh, first of all, we need to apply custom resource definition first using kubectl and then deploy the operators. And finally, we get the status of the operators. Yeah, so this is how we how we do it, okay. Uh, we use uh, kubectl apply basically to apply the CRD, the custom resource definitions for the operator, and then uh, we apply the operator. And we just need to wait for the operators to complete. Installations to complete and running. Yeah, done. So that's the thing. Okay, so now hold on. 
Yeah. This is how to install in ODB cluster. Just now we install operators using two methods, uh, using uh, uh, manifest files and using Helm chart. So to install, you know, I mean to deploy in ODB clusters on Kubernetes, we also have two methods. Uh, first is using manifest files. Okay, uh, in order to uh, install that using manifest, we need to have like, you know, create a secret file. Uh, secret, uh, Kubernetes secret. Kubernetes secret is like a key value store that to store root password when we uh, set up um, the InnoDB clusters. We need to have like, you know, a same root password across uh, InnoDB cluster uh, nodes. So we, we, we store that uh, uh, password as a secret. So this is the uh, uh, manifest files, as you see over here. Okay, uh, it will deploy three node in ODB clusters and uh, it will deploy one routers. Done. So that's all, very simple. So by this stitch, we already get uh, uh, three clusters nodes and plus additional uh, one routers later on. Yeah, have three clusters nodes, one router. So very simple, we just need to deploy this, uh, create this manifest file and apply. Or alternatively, we can use uh, Helm. Yeah, we can use Helm chart. Run this, okay, uh, without creating a secret whatsoever, just uh, run uh, Helm chart, then <coughs> Helm to install, to deploy uh, InnoDB clusters. Done, so kubectl minus n, MySQL Desk Cluster is the namespace that I use uh, to deploy the InnoDB clusters. And get IC in the InnoDB cluster is actually the uh, custom resource distribution or CRD, okay, uh, as part of the MySQL operator installation and watch. Once done, you will have you know uh, three nodes in InnoDB cluster and one MySQL router. Very simple. Yeah. This is how to uh, manage the InnoDB clusters, okay? Through, um, you know, a kubectl command, basically. Uh, we can easily get the status of the InnoDB cluster. Yeah. Yeah, let's say, uh, I do port forwarding. Let's say we want to connect to the InnoDB clusters. Okay, we can use uh, port forwarding and then uh, connect from the outside of the uh, Kubernetes. Okay, uh, we have uh, uh, three node InnoDB cluster and one routers. If we want to scale up, okay, we don't need to you know, do extra, much extra work. What we need is basically just to uh, create a YAML files and just change three to five, okay? Instant number of instances from three to five and then apply. That's it. Then MySQL operators will works, okay, to deploy, uh, to scale up the InnoDB cluster from three nodes to five nodes. Yeah, as you see over here, Okay, I have five nodes and two routers. Okay, because I edit the YAML files and then apply the YAML file using kubectls. Done, five nodes in ODB cluster. So we can also use uh, kubectl edit if you don't want to use, uh, you don't, if, you, if you think that, you know, uh, using VI and use you know, to edit, uh, edit the, the, the YAMLs, uh, maybe uh, too, uh, too much extra step, then actually you can use edit. You can uh, use a kubectl edit to edit the uh, InnoDB clusters definitions, okay, to set the instance from three to five and then uh, just apply that, I mean, just exit from that. Then, you know, Kubernetes will create an additional two nodes, uh, two pods, yeah, for uh, InnoDB cluster and additional one pot for MySQL routers. And InnoDB, InnoDB cluster operator, I mean MySQL operators, will configure that additional two pots, okay, run configure instance and add instance to make sure that MySQL is running to 
in additional two pods uh, will be a part of the InnoDB cluster. Okay, so InnoDB cluster will be uh, expanded or scale up uh, uh, from three nodes uh, to five nodes. Okay, uh, to upgrade is very simple. So we can play with the uh, various versions. Okay, we can add uh, more versions, something like this. Of course, you need to download the. Uh, uh, if you are playing with uh, with the uh, enterprise Docker image, then you need to download the uh, enterprise uh, container image first. But if you play with the uh, um, com uh, community image, then um, you will try to download. Okay, the complete one, okay, the YAML files, okay, the expanded uh, view of the YAML files can be something like this. You can pick up the versions, okay, and uh, you can setting the VVC size, for example, for the gigabyte, okay, and there will be a three node InnoDB cluster, in this case, three node InnoDB clusters, and routers one instance. Each of the node InnoDB cluster will have PVC uh, with size uh, 40 gigabyte, okay. Then, um, InnoDB is basically uh, the way we want to um, uh, configure the InnoDB cluster for the first time. So by saying that InnoDB uh, come from cloning, that means that you already have uh, InnoDB clusters over there, and you want to create a clone of that InnoDB clusters. So we can use uh, this uh, setup, okay? Download URLs, or minus square cluster zero, to minus square. I mean, this will connect to, to uh, this pod, in another clusters, another clusters, okay, clone that and create a new clusters using this with three node in the DB clusters and routers one instance. And if you want to modify uh, my.cnf, okay, the in DB, I mean the MySQL uh, option files, okay, uh, this is the way how to do. You can add additional configurations over here, okay, that required by the application specific. So uh, we also, uh, our operator also uh, provide a logical backup, okay, with uh, using backup profile, something like this. Okay, you can configure the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the YAML, something like this, and then you, you can apply. And we can configure the backup schedule also inside. Or if you want to do a, a physical backup, uh, we support clone. Okay, so there will be a, you know, InnoDB uh, storage engine cloning, right? Create a snapshot, deploy a snapshot to another port, and then, you know, and restart that port so that the, you will have a completely identical um, new database at that point in time when you, you start the clone, yeah? We also support the logical backup to OCI object storage. Okay, there will be a OCI credentials over here and so on, and then you just uh, configure that into your YAML files, yeah. Uh, so this is the self healing mechanisms. Uh, when we talk about InnoDB clusters running on VM or bare metals, maybe uh, there's additional step that you need to make sure that uh, VM or bare metal is back available upon a failure. But since this is Kubernetes, then if we have uh, one of the pod crash, the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes will try to starting up the instance again. Okay, this is the demo, basically. Okay, so we have uh, five nodes in ODB clusters, and uh, uh, we try to connect to one of the nodes. I mean, we try to connect to the ODB clusters uh, from the uh, routers, I believe. And over here, we try to delete. Yeah, delete means that uh, <laughs> we simulate one of the nodes inside the NDB cluster crash. Uh, and as you see over here, actually uh, the Kubernetes will starting up that pod again upon failure. And uh, once the pod up, MySQL container up, and the group replications, the cluster framework of the NDB clusters, will try to rejoin back the, the fail nodes, these fail nodes to the cluster so that you know everything end to end is automatic, start from the infrastructure layers, uh, I mean the virtualization layers and then the, the InnoDB cluster database uh, to make sure that uh, database service will be always be available uh, from the application and so on. Okay, 
So this is how to upgrade to the enterprise versions. Okay, you can download the enterprise uh, editions uh, from Dev. Um, I mean from uh, Metalink, uh, from support.oracle.com, or from edelivery.oracle.com, or from or you know Oracle Registry, Oracle Container Registry. <coughs> yeah, this is how to upgrade to the enterprise editions. Yeah, as you see over over there, the status is still using community servers, and we want to upgrade uh, to the uh, enterprise editions. Uh, first of all, okay, we need to have a, a container image uh, running on our uh, Kubernetes repository, or we can use the uh, yeah. We need to run this uh, container image. No, we need to have the container image running on our repository. Then we can change the YAML file, something like that. Add this one, edition and enterprise, image repository MySQL, image pull policy is never. So as you see, uh, once you apply this, uh, I mean YAML, then it will upgrade the uh, community edition of the InnoDB cluster running on Kubernetes become enterprise editions. As you see over here, the status is commercial editions. And I'm using 8.0.29. Right now, the uh, versions, MySQL versions available right now is 8.0.30. Okay, that's it. Okay, the InnoDB clusters on Kubernetes uh, using MySQL operators. And uh, thank you so much. Well, no, normally how you upgrade the Kubernetes, let's say, you know, how you patch the Kubernetes. What is the impact uh, towards the applications that are running, uh, workload that are running inside? Are they, uh, you can do rolling upgrades or, I think Kubernetes uh, will allow you to rolling upgrade, right? It's just tiny, the upgrade function. The device running, you can do it, can rolling upgrade. I think you will you will patch. Uh, I'm no I don't know because I never upgrade the Kubernetes uh, versions, but I think you you need to patch uh, worker node by worker node, right, to upgrade that. Okay, let's say you have three not in clusters, right? Um, and like uh, we explained that you cannot lose uh, two cluster members, right? So you, if, you, if you want to shut down the uh, Kubernetes worker nodes, okay, one by one uh, to upgrade, then, you know, the InnoDB clusters running on Kubernetes will make sense. Reasons why? Because let's say you, you run every node of the InnoDB cluster on each own worker nodes. So if you upgrade worker node one by one, then you know you shut down this, the cluster is still working, right? You upgrade, you're starting up, MySQL is bringing up to that nodes, and it's joined back to the clusters, right? And you are working on the second worker nodes. You shut down that, MySQL is still working, working on uh, worker node one and worker node three. 
Okay, you're starting up again. Okay, cl clusters node, I mean, MySQL, you bring up automatically, it will automatically rejoin. And now you upgrade the, the, the node one, the work, worker node one. Okay, shutting on the worker node one, upgrade. And once you're starting up, all the nodes will come up, including the, the primary node. I don't know, when you shut down, it's actually doing the primary failovers. The, the primary is already, you know, failover to the second node or third node, right? That kind of things. So, yeah. How to make it? Okay, uh, when we upgrade the image that running on stateful set or deployments in Kubernetes, they always started with not the last nodes. Let's say we have uh, five nodes in ODB clusters. Okay, node number zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, and then we upgrade the image to upgrade the MySQL instance over there. Then uh, it will do uh, rolling one by one, started with the last node. Always started with the last node. And it is very important to, um, to do, right, to make sure when we do upgrade, the primary node need to, to be on node one, not zero, okay? Reasons why, because if we are, um, you know, if we don't set that, right, for example, primary node running on node two, node three, node four, node five, then it will may, the, may be the case that the primary node will fail over to the first nodes and later on when the Kubernetes shutting down the first node, another primary fell over again, okay? Because uh, Kubernetes will start with node, node five, node four, node three, node two, node one. So in order to prevent two times failovers, okay, then the primary node will be on node one. Okay, make sure. Okay, make sure, and then we apply the YAML file with the new versions, okay? Then it will shutting down node five, starting up node five, starting up node four, starting up node four, and so on. Until finally node one, shutting down. Finally fell over, starting up. <laughs> okay? How about the routers? Router is stateless. It's the same concept. Let's say we have uh, three routers, for example. Okay? Uh, before application can reach routers, it will reach the uh, service, load balancer service, right? Cluster IP. It's this cluster IP is, uh, functions as load balancers. Either it's going to router number zero, one, or two. Okay? Or one, two, three, right? 
uh, if you want to upgrade routers, it's much more easier. There is no failovers because it's stateless. So it's always running on. It will always uh, shutting down router number three first. OK, starting on number three, shutting down router number one, number two, and starting up again, number one, and starting up again. OK, and the application connection will always be there. OK, of course, uh, if any application that actually hitting the router number three, when it shut down, then application need to reconnect again to the load balancer service, to the service, the cluster IP service, uh, to connect to another two nodes. Okay. <laughs> Not using my corporators, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, that 50 connection is, uh, it depends. If the 50 connection is actually all is on a read-write port, right, it will go, every, every, every connection will go to the primary node. So they are not uh, sharing the, the, the threads. So each of the connection will create uh, one thread in the InnoDB clusters. Okay. Sure. Uh, the MySQL routers is like uh, it's just routing to route the connection traffic. So it's not doing the uh, the uh, no, what do you call it? Router. There. Yes, it's not the yes, just doing the routing only.
哎<咳>，我在，听到吗？喂。哎，听到吗？听到啊，清楚啊，是啊，<笑>是啊，是啊，刚刚就是你你我我的声音可以播出来吗？哦，是啊，<笑>刚才 Kevin 连在吗？是吧？刚才提。嗯，我听到你说我我在英国嘛，是啊，是跟跟跟跟跟跟 Kev Kevin Kevin 讲的吧 ，Kevin 啊，对啊，是啊，他他在啊，哎 Kevin， 他刚走开，<笑>是啊，嗯、哦，早上挺好啊，人人，哈哈哈哈哈，没事，嗯。吃完了吗？吃完了，是吧？好，然后，早上，现在是六六点，六点钟，<笑>没事，应该的，呃，是，那<笑>啊，阿兰都什么时候呃回去啊？啊，礼拜一哦，就是明天哦，今天是礼拜一天嘛，明天是吧？哦，是，他来了一个一个礼拜。<笑>哦，是，好好好，就这样，好。
好，那呃，各位午安，呃，我们就把握时间好了。呃，下面这个 session 呢，由我们呃 MySQL 的呃，我们叫 Cloud Evangelist， 就是呃云的云云总顾问工程师，呃呃 Ryan 关关俊联，那为各位介绍呃，在 MySQL 的云底下一个最新的一个发展。那谈到我们有个叫 h i t w a y h i t w a y 它是一个快速查询的引擎。除了这个以外，我们在 h i t w a y 上面甚至还可以加上一些，加上更进一步的 machine learning 功能。啊，那我们单查 database 里面的历史记录可以看过去。那从过去你要预测未来的话，那我们底下加了 machine learning 的一个能力，它可以从资料里面去建立一些模型出来。那然后透过这个模型呢，你可以拿到。一个新的资料，或是可以预测你一个趋势，啊，比如说你在模型上面，像它是一些数学模式哈，那是包含像 classification 啊，像 regression 这些，那它可以根据你的呃现在新进来的资料，给你预测说这个啊这个客户，这个新的客户，大概可以从上面赚多少钱，或者我可以从这个客户是他有兴趣看的呃这促销活动是什么等等，那这些呢都是 machine learning 的能力，那我们这个地方就有呃。呃 ，Ryan 关呢为各位介绍这个呃 h i t w a y 上面的 machine learning 的部分啊。那呃，因为疫情关系，呃 ，Ryan 他是被在马来西亚啊，因为疫情的关系啊，所以他进来也比较比较麻烦一点，所以呃，这次他也没法直接到现场。那他用先用预录的方式来呃来跟各位说明。那但我要看看他现在是不是能够上线。如果能上线的话，到时候结束的时候可以请他跟各位现场回答他呃各位的问题。OK， 那我们就先开始了。Hello, welcome to CrossCup 2022 in Taipei. My name is、uh, Ryan Kwan. I'm a MySQL solution engineer with the MySQL、uh, APEC team.、Um, today, unfortunately, can't be here with you physically, but I'm happy to share with you our latest innovation in MySQL at Oracle Cloud. MySQL Heatwave. Particularly, I'm going to focus on the、uh, machine learning capability that we just introduced in MySQL Heatwave. Let me first give you a little bit、uh, quick update on、uh, MySQL. MySQL is the number one open source database、uh, according to DB Engine. DB Engine is a organization that ranks database. According to their、uh, popularities, so they measure the popularity of a system by using numbers of mentions on website, Google Trends, frequency of technical discussion on Stack Overflow and other sites, number of job offers, relevance in social network, and other criteria. You can see that the、uh, MySQL is、um, you know right behind、uh, Oracle Database, and、uh, it's continue you know the the popularity has been increasing、uh, in the recent years. So MySQL,、um, the latest release is 8.0, and I know that、uh, there are a lot of、uh, users <laughs> out there still using 5.7,、uh, but、uh, 8.0 is the um, um, the most important、uh, release of MySQL because、uh, it's added a lot of、uh, functions and features that uh, uh, help uh, in improve the productivity of developers, such as the JSON support. As well as、um, you know, the business intelligence functions, being able to use the window functions and common table expression. So if you're still using 5.7, and、uh, I strongly encourage you to、uh, start looking at you know, 8.0, because our cloud, you know, the MySQL database in the cloud, it's all based on 8.0. So here is a two、uh, survey that conducted by a very popular、uh, developer community as well as、uh, developer tools.、Um, so Stack Overflow、uh, developer has been saying that、uh, MySQL is still is the number one most popular database among the developers、um, in project they、uh, did in the past 12 months. As well as、uh, in JetBrains, MySQL, you know, it's.、Uh, Uh, it is a favorite among the developers. Besides the developer community, you know, MySQL also very popular among the、um, uh, enterprise as well as、um, you know the social、uh, social uh, enterprise.、Um, 
for example, you know, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Uber, Netflix. MySQL became very popular as part of the LAMP stack, right? Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP for web and e-commerce application. Because it's so easy to use, and um, you know, once you download from a website, install it, and you're up and running. Um, so, and, and, and sometimes when I talk to people, people are quite surprised that, uh, hey, well, I didn't know, you know, Facebook is using MySQL. So that shows you how popular uh, is MySQL. Okay, so um, I hope I give you a quick overview of MySQL and also a little bit update on uh, MySQL. Um, now I just want to um, talk to you about our latest innovations uh, in MySQL. Uh, it's called the MySQL Heatwave on Oracle Cloud. MySQL Heatwave is designed and built natively on Oracle Cloud infrastructure. Oracle Cloud is the first public cloud that built from the ground up to be a better cloud for enterprise. Um, all the Oracle enterprise applications such as ERP, HCM, uh, customer experience, all runs on the robust, secure cloud infrastructure. Um, so uh, MySQL Heatwave Rest assured, it's secure and high performance. So on this slide, I want to show you, um, you know, a quick overview of the entire Oracle Cloud infrastructure. So today, um, the Oracle Cloud consists of more than 70 cloud services, um, ranging from the uh, VMs, the container Kubernetes infrastructure, uh, storage, networking, um, um, database, and uh, and one of the important uh, uh, MySQL uh, cloud services on the Oracle Cloud, uh, analytics, and so on. So it's a complete cloud service um, portfolio that allows you to build a robust application uh, using MySQL on Oracle Cloud. So what is MySQL Heatwave? MySQL Heatwave is a plugin that's designed and developed on top of the MySQL database engine. So we have the uh, MySQL um, proven and trusted database engine called InnoDB. Uh, Heatwave is a plugin that developed on top of the InnoDB engine. So today, um, we have delivered um, the industry fastest query accelerator that, um, that is able to accelerate your long running queries. And today, uh, we're gonna focus on um, this latest innovation that we, um, that we introduced in Heatwave, um, the machine learning uh, capabilities. Right, so Moscow Heatwave, um, it's the industry first hybrid database that support your OLTP application, your OLED application for analytics, uh, for reporting, and now we are, in, we are adding uh, machine learning capability so that you can enable uh, machine learning in your application uh, easily. So there's no need for uh, moving your data from the transactional into a separate uh, database to do machine learning or uh, export your data into um, you know, object store and then run your machine learning algorithms on those. Today, you can do it all within the MySQL database. Okay, let me just give you a quick um, summary of um, the key differentiation of MySQL Heatwave comparing to other cloud services in uh, AWS, in Azure, or uh, Google. So MySQL Heatwave is designed and built as a hybrid database to power all your um, applications, uh, transactional, OLAP, BI, and now we added the machine learning. And uh, the key the difference between us and the other cloud service is that the MySQL Heatwave is based on 
um, the MySQL Enterprise Edition. So what is this Enterprise Edition? Um, so we have two different edition um, uh, MySQL. So one is the MySQL community that you uh, may be very familiar that you can download freely from MySQL.com. And we also have this uh, Enterprise Edition, which is on a subscription uh, uh, base where you can run um, for your enterprise workload, right? So if, if you work in the banks, uh, telco, uh, insurance, that you need um, capability that's missing from community, such as um, uh, data encryption, such as the audit, uh, such as uh, you know, enterprise backup, um, all this are um, packaged in the enterprise edition. So the Moscow Heatwave uh, is developed and built on top of this enterprise edition, okay? And in, in our uh, benchmark um, on Moscow Heatwave, uh, it's proven that um, you um, can improve performance of your long-running queries um, without any changes to your code or to your SQL in order to take advantage of Heatwave. Right, so if you're running uh, MySQL application, you know, long running report, uh, complex SQL queries, immediately you know, using MySQL Heatwave, it, it can improve performance. And here are some of the uh, numbers that uh, we publish um, you know, comparing to others. All right, so before I jump into uh, machine learning, I want to show you very quickly you know, how um, you can use Heatwave to accelerate your queries. Right, so very quickly, I want to show you um, this new cool tools that uh, we um, just recently uh, developed and currently in preview uh, version, uh, preview um, uh, edition, um, a mask of shell plug into the VS Code. Um, so you can use this uh, tool to uh, work with mask of Heatwave, right? So here you see that um, you know I'm I can connect to the Oracle Cloud. And um, I could choose whichever database uh, I want to work with. So in this case, I'm, I'm so I I'm want to connect to this uh, Heatwave database, um, and I have a database called the Airport DB. Um, once you're connected to the um, uh, database, you can start uh, you know working with the data. Um, but let me just uh, reconnect again. <clears throat> So um, what it would do is it would uh, connect to a Bastion uh, service on Oracle Cloud. The reason that we use a Bastion service is because uh, MySQL is always provisioned in a private network uh, without any public IP. So we need to connect to the Bastion service. Once you connect it, you could uh, you know, use uh, the database, start using it, uh, and work with your data. Right. So. Um, this is, um, you know, a, a very exciting uh, plugin, and uh, I believe uh, developers um, will, will like this. Okay, before I show you a demo on how you can accelerate your queries, uh, let me just, uh, you know, uh, explain a little bit about um, how the um, Heatwave engine works. <coughs> so. Um, as mentioned before, you know, Heatwave is a plugin to the MySQL database. Um, so you have the uh, MySQL database engine, and um, you have insert, update, delete. Uh, so th those transactions will still, um, you know, uh, be executed in the InnoDB engine. Um, and Heatwave as a plugin, uh, it will manage your um, uh, long-running query, you know, select statement. And one thing I'm not uh, explained is that uh, Heatwave um, um, manage and partition the data in the memory, and that's why you know you, you get um, you know super fast performance because the data is partitioned. Uh, in this case, in, in diagram, you know I have three nodes. So if you have a hundred terabyte of data, 
that will be uh, split uh, into these three heat wave clusters, and the data will be um, uh, partitioned and uh, stored in a memory. So when you run a uh, queries, um, uh, um, it, it, it would um, then get pushed down to the heat wave clusters, in this case, uh, three nodes, and the queries will be split and uh, distributed into these three nodes, get the data, and then uh, consolidate, and the result will be uh, uh, sent it back to the application. And that's why you get um, super fast performance because of the parallel processing uh, in the heat wave clusters, as well as uh, you know, the data it's uh, being fetched from the memory. So today, uh, heat wave support uh, from one node to um, 64 uh, nodes. All right, so let me show you how you can accelerate uh, queries. You can use any one of your favorite tools to work with the uh, you know, um, uh, heat wave. So I'm just uh, here using a Jupyter notebook to um, show you how you can um, uh, speed up your queries on a uh, heat wave. So first of all, I'm, I, I'm loading uh, these SQL modules. And then I need to connect to the MySQL heat wave. Right, so in this case, I, I want to uh, work with the airport DB that I showed you earlier. Um, once you get connected, uh, you can then um, send your queries uh, to heat wave. So I have a timer, and I have this uh, parameters. Uh, use secondary engine equal to off. So what it does is what it, what it's saying is that uh, you know we want to I want to show you uh, if you run these queries on just a regular MySQL database uh, what is the performance right so secondary engine is the heat wave engine in this case you know the queries um, executed in 11.3 seconds right so basically tell um, just uh, getting passengers from this three country from the database so now I you know um, set the uh, engine. To heat wave, you can see that immediately, you know, the queries, you know, uh, speed up, you know, in less than a second. It's 200 milliseconds, which is already like 50 times uh, faster, right? So, so what happened, right? There's no change to the SQL statement, and uh, but performance, uh, you know, jump, you know, improved by 50 times. So let me show you what uh, happened uh, at the back end, right? So, uh, copy the SQL statement. And uh, <coughs> to explain on the SQL statement so that you know what happened at, at the back end. So essentially, you know, this query uh, is executed in the uh, Rapid Engine, right? So the, which is a heat wave uh, database. And if I um, set the secondary engine to off um, and then run the explain again, you'll see that um, you know the the the, the uh, queries will be you know. Uh, executed in the regular MySQL database. So that's how easy it is for you to um, use HeatWave without changing, modifi uh, modifying your SQL statement, um, and then get performance uh, improvement. So another uh, example uh, that I want to show here is that uh, you know a, a dashboard uh, on COVID patient. Right. So this is uh, we developed this uh, for. Um, to, to showcase to people that how they can uh, also you know um, accelerate uh, slow running uh, dashboard. So on the left hand side, this is a dashboard that runs on heatwave, and on the right hand side, it's um, you know dashboard without heatwave. 